The Speaking from Experience Entrepreneurship Lecture Series, sponsored by Champlain College's BYO Biz Program, brings leading entrepreneurs to campus where they share their experience and wisdom with Champlain students and the local community. Tonight, we are proud to present Dawn and Michael Lancaster, founders of Carve Solutions, the fast-growing specialty gift company located in Williston, Vermont. Tonight, we have a great uh, speaking from experience lecture for you to, to, to enjoy. And I say enjoy, although I see a lot of you are there with your computers taking notes. And that's appreciated, too, by Professor Nagelschmidt and Professor McKee. Uh, and is Sue Carney here, too? No? OK. Well, um, okay. um, these, these talks are great because we hear from entrepreneurs and they tell wonderful stories about their business and how it uh, got started and all the struggles they went through and the lessons they learned. Uh, and every now and then, they also give us some insight into the human dimension of that whole adventure. Uh, well, tonight, we've got two uh, wonderful entrepreneurs who not only have a wonderful business story to tell, but also a wonderful uh, personal story, and, and uh, the more I learned about the Lancasters, I thought, boy, there's a great screenplay in here somewhere. <laughs> high school sweet, I mean, think of it, high school sweethearts, uh, off to college at Champlain. Uh, applaud, <laughs> Monier, thank you. Uh, off to college, stay together through college. Most of us, that didn't happen with our high school sweetheart, but they did it. And they had a dream uh, from the time they were uh, young kids in high school. And what amazes and impresses me is how they stuck to that dream and how they made it happen. So tonight, um, we're going to meet the people who made this happen. And right now, I'd like to introduce Dawn and Mike Lancaster, our guests. Champlain graduates, and as in every good business partnership, uh, there's always a division of labor, and the partners, and I've been this th through this a couple of times, you figure out uh, really quickly what, every, what, what one person is good at and what the other person is good at, and you also figure out what you're not so good at, and hopefully if you're smart, you'll s stick to what you're good at and let the other person do what they're good at, and it's the same tonight. So. Um, in the restaurant business, it's sometimes called the uh, back of the house and the front of the house, or sometimes it's called uh, Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside. Well, uh, I think you guys have figured it out really well, and tonight uh, we're going to hear uh, mainly uh, from Ms. Outside, and that's Dawn. So Dawn, why don't you come up here and take it from there, and welcome. Can you all hear me okay? Excellent. So being the outside girl, I'm going to stick with my notes a little bit because otherwise I'll have you here all night long, <coughs> have lots to say. I have to tell you that I'm remarkably humbled to be here tonight, to be in a situation to be able to share with you what we've experienced is really a treat for us as well. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to do so. I think that our story is interesting because I was in seventh grade when I met Mike. I was 12 years old. I was two years older than our daughter Sarah is now. And I was quite the tomboy. I was my dad's only son, the youngest of three girls. And even as a tomboy, I was quite taken by Mike's gorgeous blue eyes, his gorgeous tousled hair, which has gone away, <laughs> <laughs> and the great smile that he gives me that still 30 years later still gets me every day. The interesting thing was is we lived about a mile driveway to driveway from each other. And we enjoyed biking together, playing basketball, getting into a little bit of trouble here and there, but we were basically good kids. We both came from families that had three older sisters, two older sisters on my side, three on his. So Mike was used to a lot of estrogen around. And <laughs> it definitely, you know, gives a, gives a boy an edge when he's got that experience. By the time I was 16, we were a solid couple. And Mike informed me shortly after we started to date that, you know, if we ever had something that we couldn't get through together and we broke up, that was it. There was no going up. There was not gonna be the kind of couple that had the breakup and they got back together and they broke up and they got back together. It was going to be over. 
And I, you know, that sounded good to me. It was commitment. And uh, with that said, it doesn't mean that you don't fail each other. You know, there's a time in all of our lives that, you know, we make mistakes and we fail each other, but that doesn't mean you quit. It's, you know, many times my dear friend Anne O'Brien says, you know, once you learn that lesson, it's yours to keep. And every failure gives you a lesson. I thank you for sharing that with me, too, because it makes you realize why. The interesting thing is that ever since high school, we had this dream that we would graduate high school, we'd go to college, we'd get good jobs, we'd save some money, we'd start a business, and we'd have a baby. It didn't all happen in the same order that we thought it would happen in. You know, it all was in 1986. And I would definitely say that Mike's embarrassment started there, too, <laughs> in many ways. Mike has always been the silent type. He's the thinker. He's the schemer. He's the inventor. And I'm the rapport builder, the networker, the girl that's going to say hi to strangers and embarrass you and make you talk to people you don't know. So that's another reason why I'm up here tonight, hopefully not embarrassing him too much. One of the things that I want to pop you through is the people on the bus. I'm sure you guys have heard in your classes the right people on the bus. It's very important to have the right people on the bus. It's also very important to make sure they're in the right seat. If I was in charge of our manufacturing, even though I'm the right person to be on the bus, our business would have failed miserably. Mike's three older sisters graduated from Champlain College. Thank you, Steve, for the great photo. <laughs> so it made sense for Mike to follow them as well. You should know about Mike that he really never got to a point in his life that he truly enjoyed going to school. And high school was no different. He's the type of person that if everyone isn't treated fairly and they aren't lifted up equally, he's got no tolerance for that. And I mean, everybody remembers high school. You know, the cliques, the drama, everything that happens didn't work for him. And I think that for us, Champlain was really a surprise. He came to school within the electronics tech program, which is no longer here. It was a great program. He discovered a core group of students that had the same technical interests he did. They were creative. They built things. They designed things. They were engaging. And he was also given professors that finally, for the first time in his life, challenged him in a way that he had never experienced before. The other thing that he also experienced, which I do get kind of a chuckle out of it, was his first big fat F on a paper. And when he brought the big fat F, he was pretty ticked off. What was up with this big fat F? It was a perfect paper. We hand wrote papers back then pages and pages of handwriting. There wasn't any typing. I'm not sure if anybody still handwrites papers anymore. Mike has probably the most horrendous penmanship I've ever seen in my life. And even though it was a perfect paper, the teacher said, nope, I expect more from you. But that gave Mike the beginning of where everything had to be perfection. It wasn't just the idea, it was the presentation of the idea as well. The other good thing about Mike being so into his freshman year of college is that it was my senior year of high school. And my senior year of high school was very homework heavy. And finally having him interested in a class and his homework definitely made sure that we both got better grades because he's a little distracting to me. I personally always enjoyed school. It was easy for me. I wasn't a clicky girl. I kind of fit in wherever I went. And at times, I'm sure my mom would say that I was a little too social. But I got good grades. And when it came time for me to apply to a school, I really could have gone anywhere. In my senior year of high school, Guess how many, how many campus applications I filled out? Guess how many campuses I visited? One. Isn't that crazy? Your senior in high school, you fill out one application. I only wanted to go to Champlain. Because I knew with Champlain, I would be ready to work. And we had so many goals to attain, I had to get to work. My dad had informed me that since he was going to pay for my college education, that I would be taking two majors. One would be business management, and the other would be marketing management and retailing. I wanted to do something in psychology because I like people. I think it's probably a good idea that I didn't do psychology. Even though both of my degrees were AS degrees, they kept me very busy. Summers did not exist. It was all work and no play. I would say, do you know this gentleman? Does anybody know Jim Thornton? Jim was a person who was very, he, he made you work for it. And I was definitely the kind of student who had strong beliefs. I was very passionate about business. And even if he agreed with me, he would make me fight for it. He'd make me stand up, prove my theory, and make me fight for it. And that really gave me the ability to negotiate differently as I got older in life, because I had to prove what I was doing. 
I also had an internship. I'm sure some of you have internships now. Champlain, we love Champlain interns, by the way. My intern was at 95 X. Sounded great for a marketing major. I was gonna be able to field the radio station. It was Walton Law back then. And every now and then it was the Champlain marketing student. My focus at uh, 95 X as a marketing major was to work with the sales department that did the um, advertising sales. And within those advertising sales, they needed a lot of photocopying and a lot of filing and a lot of stapling. And for me, even though they trusted me enough to send me a loan on movie show remotes, I would drag Mike along. He did not enjoy those much, but it was still fun. I walked away without, I walked away with a bumper sticker. I didn't walk away with something that I could stick on my resume. I didn't walk away with a reference that I could say, hey, look what I did. And that was discouraging for me. So that's one of the reasons why we're so passionate about our interns. Our interns do things that are specific to their majors. And they understand why they're doing and they learn from them. And we engage them to teach us because you guys experience things now that we didn't. The one thing I did learn, I could make a typewriter sound like a machine gun. It was a fabulous thing at my internship. I also have to say, does anybody know Erica? Is Erica here? Where? Erica! <laughs> Erica's my next intern. She doesn't know it yet. I've been waiting to see her. <laughs> it's good for you. So when Mike graduated college, he found a great job at Seuss Microtech. It's in Waterbury. Now it's called, um, or was Carl Seuss, and now it's Seuss Microtech. And he quickly started making our future a reality. What he did at Seuss Microtech really changed our lives. The leaders there realized very quickly that Mike was also very mechanical. And so they put him into his apprentice program. He learned all about being a mechanical engineer as well. He excelled in this field, and the proud Champlain grad holds patents in the US and Germany. It's pretty exciting. He was the kind of student, or the kind of employee, that would really work hard. It was all about the hard working ethic. They had sent him to Germany to do a 12 week program. It was a design build program. He finished that job in perfection in six weeks. That's where Suze put the right person on the bus. Now I look at the things that Mike had designed and built, and I don't really understand them. I know they're really expensive. I know they're really intense. I know they have a lot of robots, a lot of lights, and it's darn impressive. But that's definitely his forte and not mine. Straight out of Champlain, I landed a job at Merrill Lynch. I was 19 years old, and I was Series 7 and 63 registered. And what that means is I was trading on the stock exchange. I was working for a senior vice president. Now, at the same time that I got registered, so did a bunch of guys. They were about five years older than me. When I was 23 years old, I was still at Merrill Lynch, and I was still a registered assistant, and these guys were financial consultants. And for me, the five-year difference didn't make sense. I should have been a financial consultant. So I said, it's time to be an entrepreneur. I'm done with this. And I went on to business consulting. 20 years later, the eight-year-old that used to visit me in my office <coughs> is in my position at Merrill Lynch. And she's a Champlain grad. I think that's kind of amazing. Champlain keeps putting them out there. When I was 21, Mike and I were married. That was a long time ago. <laughs> Skinny. Um, I wanted to be old enough to drink a toast at my wedding, and so we waited till I was 21 to do that. We feel very fortunate for the relationship that we have. It's you know been a learning experience for both of us, but definitely something that we're happy to do. When we first got our first home, it was uh, the apartment over Mike's grandfather. He was 91 when we got married, and so Mike took a big closet, turned it into my office. I would sit in my little closet, sit in my computer. IBM PS2 or something antique with a dot matrix printer. And one day we were talking about what this business was going to be. And we decided there was this company called Dream Designs. And Dream Designs made um, personalized signs for businesses or for homes. And that's what we were going to do. Well, with every entrepreneurial experience, there are a gazillion different ideas that you don't you know, bring to fruition. 
Within less than a year of our wedding, we bought our first home in Williston. And I wanted an office there too. So he built me another office. And it was much bigger than the closet. I started a company called Small Business Solutions. And my focus there was basically to manage other companies and teach them how to market themselves, to sell, to do their accounting, to understand their finances, and you know help them along. But without Mike being involved, it wasn't that fun. And I could only make it so big because I'm selling my time. And there wasn't too much you could do about that. The one thing I should mention that I forgot is um, when we bought this house in Williston, we had taken every penny that we had and put it down on this house, except for enough to cover our grocery bill that week. Now, Mike is very frugal. So when I wrote that check at the closing table and handed it to them, I thought he was either going to vomit or have a coronary, knowing that everything he had worked for is now gone, except for that one week of the grocery bill. But that frugality is something that's important for any business owner to have. In 2000, that's actually 2004, but in 2000, our daughter Sarah was born. And she was no easy task. We had a 12% chance of success to have her. And we decided to put all our money into her too, so we did that. <laughs> and she was totally worth it. Every single blood, sweat, and tear that was dropped is definitely worth it. But after Sarah was born, we found that there was this burning inferno. We had great careers, we had the house, we'd been saving money, but there was still no consistency. So I felt that I needed to buckle down, be the good employee. You know, Mike had done such a good job about you know, putting his desires aside. And I started work at Yipes Auto Accessories. That was actually a really good seven years for me. My dad was in the automotive industry for 43 years. I got to enjoy guys that I'd known since I was five years old. But still, the employee hat was hard to wear. And the older Mike was getting, the harder the employee hat was for him to wear as well. So there was still that, what is that idea going to be? Now the best idea that I think so far is the butter keeper. I've never made a butter keeper. I want a butter keeper. And eventually someday everyone in the world will have a butter keeper, but right now it wasn't ready to come out. So Mike says to me, you know, we've got to think of something, got to think of something. And it's almost getting to a point where it's annoying because you can't think of something. Well, our neighbor was Peter Ash of the Twin Craft Soap Company. And he was always bringing home soap. And as the salesperson in me, I'd take a shower, check out the ingredients, and say, hmm, you know what? This automotive girl thinks these things are kind of neat. I could probably sell these. I wonder how you would sell these. But the only thing that I thought about it was that one day I'd hit Peter up for a job. Say, hey, you know, I'll sell some soap for you. Mike, on the other hand, being the engineer that he is, saw a medium to change. He said, you know what? We can personalize this. We can write people's names in this. We can market this. That could be. So we did some research. What we discovered, there's Peter. What we discovered <coughs> is that at Yipes, I was in the middle of five corporate tax returns, and I felt like that, and now Mike wanted to start a business. So it's never always the easiest time or the right time when you finally come up with an idea. So Mike started playing with his engineering skills, and the next thing we knew, we were carving soaps. What happened? when he, he finished carving the soap, was that people were pretty impressed. They liked what they had to see. We'd done some research. We found people are already car carving soaps. Actually, they're engraving them, but it's a marketing thing. And we're like, well, can we still go into business if somebody else is already doing it? You know, what's the best way to do it? What we discovered was that Mike's engineering skills made a product that was completely superior to what you're seeing on the market. We'd hand something to someone. And this is why we ended up going into business. In today's anonymous world, the art of gift giving has changed dramatically. With so many mass produced overseas items populating today's storefronts, the ability to give a gift that imparts intimate awareness of individual caring has been lost. Carve solutions bring back the warm feeling of recognition, awareness, and connection. By customizing Vermont made soaps, candles, and embroidered gifts, you can have the power to personally touch someone's soul. Think about it. How many times have you gotten a gift? Somebody bought you a vase, bought you a baseball hat, they bought you a t-shirt. But if somebody got something that was made just for you, it shows that they thought a little bit more, with a little bit of a different reaction to it. It made sense. One of the most importance of our business 
was the machinery. When Mike ordered the first base unit of our machinery, it was thousands of dollars. Again, the frugal man investing thousands of dollars. The machine comes, everybody's excited. From the basement, I hear the whirring noise of a saw on the multi-thousand dollar piece of equipment we just bought. So I went downstairs, and as the thoughtful wife, I asked him, honey, why are you cutting up this multi-thousand dollar thing we just bought? He looked at me very sympathetically and said, babe, I spent my whole life making multi-million dollar machines. I only bought that so I could chop it up and make it look like that. So, okay, that was another point in time where I consciously had to realize the right person on the bus. It wasn't for me to question what his skill was. This is his skill, not my skill. But we just needed that. That's expensive. That's not. I shouldn't worry about him cutting it up. It was definitely a good lesson. In many ways, I started creating a website for Mike. I didn't go to school for websites or graphics. I didn't know anything about a website. It was also the first time in my life that I felt like I was placating him. Remember the slide with the lady with all the paper? She was reading that, trying to make a website. I couldn't figure out how I was going to you know, position this to market it against the big guys who looked so amazing. And I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have that look. I should have had that look. So immediately, our bus started populating. We had to start pulling from the resources that we had. Any business has to start with bootstrapping. So by bootstrapping, what we did was we contacted our friends, Chris Gady, and we had him take a bunch of photos. And then I'd lean on my girlfriend, Terry Gady, another champagne gal, and say, hey, what about this business plan? What about this idea? And Mike called up some software friends and said, hey, can you build us some software? The software we have isn't going to be good enough. And we were able to find people who really wanted to help us even though our idea was as silly as personalizing soap. My dad had always been my mentor, and he passed away two years before Carb Solutions was born. So I needed to get a mentor, and I decided who better than Peter Ash of Twincraft. He was the great big brother that I never had, and he was the kind of person who comes from a place of truth. You always need somebody who's going to kick you in the rear when you're being stupid, and somebody's going to stand up and applaud with you when you're pr producing greatness. He's always good about that. That honest advice is really, really important. The other thing that Peter always told me was that when you have a business, and I was part of a small family business, you can't just give somebody a two-week notice. You have a strong responsibility, and if you walk away, you're going to damage that family or that, that business because you're not there and they need you to be there. So when I finally gave my resignation, resignation in March, I didn't start full-time with Carve Solutions until August. And for an entire year, I stayed on call. But my boss, in turn, also came and supported us every time we needed some help as well. Having a mentor in your life is really important. It could be a sister, it could be a brother, it could be a parent, it could be a teacher, it could be an older friend. But if you don't have a mentor, keep your eye out for a mentor. And don't be afraid to say, hey, you know what? I'm looking for a mentor, and you're looking pretty good to me right now, because you'll be so surprised how many people are going to say, you know what, I, I would like to help you. I do want to give back. I do have something to share with you. So Mike and I decided that once our website was complete, our business would be ready to roll. Who knows what happens after you work a zillion hours on a website. You hit publish. It's out there in the world. A day or two or a week goes by. Who knows what happens? Isn't it pretty? You know, I didn't know anything about meta tags. I didn't know anything about keywords. I didn't know anything about anything. It's kind of symmetrically pretty, but it's not really internet friendly. And I think our towels look like bags. <laughs> <laughs> but we tried. We tried. So with the, the concept of marketing, we said, hey, you know what? Let's do some direct marketing. We fit really, really well with the real estate market. You're going to close in on a home. Your real estate agent gives you a bar of soap that has your name on it. You're writing the check that's giving you the coronary that Mike had at the closing table, and you feel better because now you can wash yourself, and your real estate agent thought of you, and, and you're happy about that. So we put out, I don't know, 4,000 postcards. 
we bought this marketing list, you know, from Amazing Mail, because it sounded like a really great idea. And um, again, we're, we're new to this, so we're learning. And the whole list went all over New England and all over New York in this gorgeous postcard. And guess what happened when the postcard went out? Nothing. I think two people called. And then a year later, we were still getting postcards returned to the mail for bad addresses. But we paid for them, so that was, that was definitely good. <laughs> so we moved pretty quick. Once I went full time, it definitely started to grow the business. And as we were growing the business, things were happening pretty quickly on the opposite side. I'm definitely the kind of person who's going to pick up the phone and say, hi, my name is Dawn, you want to buy my soap. Hi, my name is Dawn, you want to buy my soap. Hi, my name is Dawn, you want to buy my soap. And I will do that all day long. It doesn't matter how many no's I get because eventually I will get a yes. And if you said no to me before, I'm going to call you back and tell you you want my soap until you say yes. It's just the way I am. It's pathetic that way. So I had mentioned to Mike, who was working in the middle of the evenings and on the weekends, that it was time for him. We're approaching Christmas. Probably a good time for him to start thinking about taking some vacation time because he was not going to be able to keep up with the orders. It was November 19th. Sarah and I were downstairs. We were setting up Mike's orders for the evening. Now keep in mind, I've been with Mike almost 20 years. He's never been late from work. An hour goes by, he's not answering his phone. An hour and a half goes by, he's not answering his phone. Two hours goes by, there's still no Mike. I'm starting to get a little bit of worry. Finally, I hear him come in the door. Well, Mike had different plans about his vacation, and as he walked down the stairs with his briefcase that was just spewing with everything that had just came out of his desk, he informed me, remember that guy that I had been training all along to take my job? Yeah, I just quit. I said, great. We had no insurance. We had no money. <laughs> but it was great. We were going to do this, you know? If we're going to do it, you might as well jump off. That's another thing to keep in mind. If you want to grow, if you want anything to change in your life, you have to get out of your comfort zone. There's just no other way around it. If you don't get out of your comfort zone, it's that definition of insanity. You're constantly doing the thing again and again and again and again. So you've got to reach out. It was so out of Mike's character to just up and leave a job that he had spent 19 years at. The biggest thing for Mike was security. You know, he had to make sure he was taking care of his family. It didn't matter how miserable his job was getting. As long as I was happy, Sarah was happy, life was good. He was doing it. But now we were carving some <laughs> full time with no money and no insurance. That's a scary thing, too. So research led us to a company called Distinctive Assets. Keep in mind, we still don't know what we're doing. I discovered that Distinctive Assets was having an event at the Renmar Studio in Hollywood. And it was a CBS primetime event that was focusing on the Dave Thomas Foundation. And that's to bring foster care and adoption awareness to the table. It tells a lot of neat stories, a lot of stars are there. And I had made a conversation with them, and guess what, they invited us to come. Out of seven companies that were there, we were the only mom and pop. Everything else was Mattel, Gucci, you know, these huge, huge names. So I said to Mike, hmm, maybe we could do this. It's only $4,000. Thought that he'd enjoy that, the frugal man that he was, and he immediately said, no, we would not be doing that. Now, knowing your coworkers and your bosses really, really well, it's going to be the best way to help you communicate. Mike is very tactile. He thinks things through. He's the prove it to me kind of guy. I'm the researcher that goes, huh, that's enough information for me. Let's go. But now I had to sell the idea to Mike. I had to sell the idea that we were going to spend $4,000 and it was going to be worth it. And that's one thing that I would love to have more students walk away with. And that's selling skills. We've got marketing skills, we've got advertising skills, but we forget about selling. So many people think of selling as a dirty word. They think about the car salesman. That was my dad. They think about the insurance salesman. That was Mike's dad. These people have very, very honed skills. And it's really skills in human nature. It brings a different understanding of how to communicate. The child has to sell to her mother that she wants something. The engineer has to sell something to R&D. The teacher has to sell something to the students. You're constantly selling. And so embracing selling is something that's really important to think about 
I'm very, very proud that I'm a salesperson and that's what I do all day long. It's not a bad, dirty work. Within that concept, I knew that I needed help getting this concept to Mike and saying, yep, it's gonna be worth it. So I called a gentleman named Lefty Gillette, and I'm not sure if anybody knows Lefty, but he's pretty much an icon in Burlington, older gentleman in his 80s. When he was in his 20s, he was a Marine, and he was on the Lucille Ball Show at the Renmar Studio. That's the same studio that this event is at. So I decided, come on, Lefty, let's sit at the conference table. You know our dining room table. We're gonna sit down and talk about it. Lefty, he said, absolutely, go for it. We talked about it, and a couple days later, I was headed to Hollywood. Mike was the one who had always flown all over the world. I wasn't really good about traveling by myself. I'm much more comfortable sitting in my hometown, you know, talking to people I know. But okay, I'll get on the airplane, I'll go to Hollywood, let's see what happens. And what happens is understanding how to communicate with what you're going to bring to the table. As I was sitting there, thinking about my travels, I knew that I was going to have to connect with people that I didn't know. I knew that I was gonna have to talk in terms that I didn't understand. I knew I was gonna have to put myself in a position where I would need help. And by doing that, I would recommend Zap. Everybody's gotta read this book, it's fabulous. It helped me understand the different people that I met along the way and helped me learn how to get them to help me. Because I didn't know what I was doing. When we got to Hollywood, it was pretty scary. I didn't even want to go out to eat. I wanted to order a Domino's pizza. We were going to give everybody peace, love, and joy, spreading a little piece of Vermont. Because in Hollywood, they didn't have peace, they didn't have love, and they didn't have joy. But if they had our soap, they would have all those things. Renmar Studios was pretty intimidating when the taxi drove me up. I wasn't quite sure what to expect. But in the end, it was remarkably, remarkably successful. The hard thing for me about having this experience was that when I brought home all the news, I called up the local CBS station and said, hey, guess what? You won't believe this. Look, Rene Russo, Fergie, James Blunt, Blunt, Dave, what was his name on that show number? I can't remember. Yeah. But it was cool and it was exciting and it was CBS prime time and boy, don't you think it's newsworthy? And the local CBS station said, yeah. <laughs> No, it's, it's not newsworthy. What else? Okay. Are you sure? They said, yeah. So I was a little bummed about that, but we got some great LA, ple LA press. They really liked us. And, um, you know, I just continued to put my own publicity out there and do everything that I could to find the press that we needed. I wasn't successful in local CBS, but I was successful in outside CBS. And we're going to come back to figuring out our competition. How do you think we look next to our competition? We look pretty crappy, don't you think? We didn't really position ourselves well. We tried. But they had huge investors. They had endless pockets. And for them, it was so easy. But we knew that we had to make a difference. We knew we had to prepare ourselves. So we went to the local key bank and made sure that we had some financial backing. Because if we didn't have the money to do what we needed to do, we weren't going to be able to succeed. When I was at Champlain, I had the joy of creating a practice business plan. I highly advise you, if you haven't done one already in your class, make one for yourself. What is your personal brand? How are you going to market yourself? You know, what is your mission? Where are you going? If you come from a place of truth and sit there in transparency and really write about yourself, You'll be surprised what you learn. The other thing that I learned when doing a business plan is that there's so many things that you don't think about when you're trying to put yourself in a position to market against your competition, to discover who really is your target demographic. And we really had to take our time to go through it. You've got to research. And you'd be surprised where you look to research. When um, we were applying Mike's experience, we learned that the top bar is ours and the bottom bar is our competition. You can see a difference between carbon and engraving. In the real world, there really is no difference. It's marketing. We market the word carved versus engraved. 
there's a visual difference. You definitely want the carp bar, not the ingrained bar, but it was really all about just the marketing. One thing that Mike does every six months is he determines what went right, what went wrong, how do we do it better, and he constantly goes back to it. And it's really a great place to be. The other thing that we learned is that Mike is really, really good about creating systems. And when you're a husband and wife team, you have to learn to talk to each other differently than you would if you were talking to your coworkers. Usually with your coworkers, you're a little bit more blunt. Usually with your boss, if you're having a bad day, you give it to him. But if Mike comes to me and says, hey, you know what, I know the accounting is your thing, but it would really work better if we did it this way, if the paper flow went this way, if the system was easier if, and as his partner, I had to learn to say, you know what, you're right. Because Mike got the systems much better than I did. Even though the accounting background was mine, he knew which cycle was easier to follow because he was working on the outside of the situation. Being up against our competitor, look at their gorgeous boxes. Aren't those amazing? These were made overseas, but they could afford to bring in a container. We couldn't afford to do that. We had one color, one shape. So we decided we had to find all of our weaknesses and make them our strengths and all of their strengths and make them our weakness. So instead of engraved, we became carved. We didn't have a bunch of fragrances or a bunch of colors because we were safe for sensitive skin and noses. Because we didn't have a ton of colors and we didn't have a ton of shapes, we always went through our inventory quicker. So we were the freshest bars in the marketplace. Our soap is made in Vermont and we couldn't afford the pretty overseas packaging. So our packaging was made in the US. We decided we were eco-luxury. It was guilt-free pampering. We were accommodating, easy to work with, and we had the fastest turnaround time. I created this 24 to 48 hour turnaround time. Mike loves that. Hurry up, get it out, get it done. We topped it off with stellar client care. It's different than customer service. Client care is when you're at a standpoint that you really care what's going on with your customer. It's not just like, what can I do for you today? Take an order. It's, hey, Susie, what's going on with you? It's a different experience. People definitely prefer that. Then we found ourselves doing trade shows. Has anybody been to a trade show? Experienced a trade show yet? They're pretty interesting. The first trade show that we walked through was in Atlanta, and it was definitely intimidating. It was three buildings, and each building is 17 to 24 stories high, and it's connected by bridges, and Mike and I would go from floor to floor and get lost and not know what building we were in. Mike had always been the one to do trade shows. Not, not me. It was just too intimidating. So I think he kind of pitied me, and when we went to our first trade show in New York, he came with me. He will, I would say he was bored. It was you know, not an engineering trade show. It was a goofy girl trade show, and by the time we got done the trade show, he decided that was the last one that he was going to do. When it came time for me to do my first show, I learned a lot. I contacted my old boss at Yipes, bootstrapping. Again, not always my forte. Can't afford a consultant, but my old boss will give me some information. He made great banners for me. He talked about the layout of how I could merchandise my booth and how I could make it look great. And we presented really, really well at our first show. In between trade shows, it's all about networking. Does everybody have a LinkedIn yet? I see arms for LinkedIn. Anybody not have a LinkedIn? Who doesn't have a LinkedIn? Somebody get that girl on LinkedIn. It's your brand. You've got to get out there. In today's market, the competition is so tight. You've got to get out there and do that. We do the Twitter thing. We do the Facebook thing. Does anybody know anything else I should be doing that I'm not doing besides Facebook, Twitter? Erica, you think of something new for me? OK. Because I want to know. If I'm supposed to be somewhere, somebody's got to tell me. I don't know everything. But we do our best to position ourselves out there. You'd be surprised on LinkedIn who I know that you need to know. Not looking at me. There's people I know that you need to know on LinkedIn, so you need to get on and link in. And if you are interested, throw me an invite. Tell me that you're from the group of Champlain. You're linked into me. My network is yours. Networking is so very important to everything that you're going to do in your life. These are people who are going to help you find jobs. These are people who will be your mentors. These are people who are going to work with you through the whole rest of your life, and you're going to be surprised who they know. I began pursuing accounts like Pottery Barn and Williams Sonoma. Our competition had such a strong hold on them, but I knew, because of all the greatness that we are, that we could do better for them. 
and I was really surprised how hard it was to get into them. When I was at the New York and National Gift Fair in 2008, it was my 39th birthday, and I got the phone call from Pottery Barn. Bonus, I was so excited. We finally were gonna have some cash flow. The other thing that happened when I was at that same show is that Adam Glassman, who's the creative director of The Oprah Magazine, walked into our booth, cleared out our booth, and I kid you not, this is what this man did. Any man in, in fashion, he's very tall, dressed really well, He's got this O Magazine thing on his badge, and he walks into my booth, and I'm like, oh. and he says to me, yes, you may hug me now. <laughs> so I did. And then he goes, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And Mike immediately overnighted everything to him. A Couple nights later, still at the trade show, I pop online to see how Mike's doing, to see if he needs me to clean up any accounting, and I see that we sent an order to Harpo. Does anybody know who Harpo? is Harpo Productions in Chicago. Thank you, thank you. See, my people know who Harpo is. <laughs> so at 11 o'clock at night, we're the family that goes to bed at nine. I call up Mike and I'm like, Mike, you shipped an order to Harpo? And he said, yeah. It was this really nice girl. She's from Chicago. Apparently they love our stuff. So whatever. And I'm like, Mike, it's Oprah. <laughs> And he was tired and he wasn't really excited, so we get off the phone and then I jumped on the hotel beds. Don't ever do that, Sarah. But I did, back and forth, many times, singing Harpo Harpo. And um, we eventually ended up making an amazing relationship with them, and now the TV show and the magazine are very supportive of things that we do. But the interesting thing is that you never know who you're going to walk into. So now I'm li on LinkedIn with Harpo. <laughs> So have you noticed yet that we're a home-based business? Have you caught that? I like to refer to us as cottage industry, not home-based, because whenever I say to somebody, hey, we're home-based, they think I have a baby on my hip, and it's crying, and I'm doing the phone thing, and the washer's in the background, and I'm trying to get something done. But it's not that way. I mean, you can see we are a legitimate manufacturing facility. And the one thing that's interesting about that is that none of our clients know that we're a cottage industry. So we've gained Pottery Barn and William Sonoma and all these big names. And the first order that we get from Pottery Barn, they need 7,000 bars, and they need a custom formula, and they need custom printed boxes. And this was like September 3rd, and they needed it by October 15th. And custom soap takes about eight to 12 weeks to manufacture, not even carve. And the custom boxes take six to eight weeks to produce, so we don't have that kind of time. But the type of relationships that we make with our vendors are partnerships. It's not just you're my vendor, you're my business partner. And so our soap manufacturer just made it miracles that you never knew could happen and produced soap basically overnight for us. Our box manufacturer did the same thing. We were ready to ship on October 13th. Thanks to Mike's family, all of our friends, my mother who took care of everything at home, we finally were able to produce this order for them. We had four pallets waiting, and Pottery Barn wasn't ready for us. They were shocked. They had never had somebody be ready ahead of schedule like that. But again, it's no risk, no reward. You've got to push yourself past those comfort zones. It wasn't comfortable for us. We had to financially put the money out to cover this purchase. People like this don't write POs anymore. They say, yeah, I project that we're going to do X, and you've got to be ready to do X. Fortunately, that one was an easier sale for Mike because it was Pottery Barn. It wasn't, I'm gonna go to Hollywood. So on the first part of December, we found ourselves on the Today Show for Hot Hollywood Gifts because of a boutique out in Hollywood that loved our stuff. And it was pretty exciting. That same December, we were found on the Oprah Magazine. We ended up being in the O List, which I was pretty surprised. It was really our first year out, and we hit the Home Run Magazine right from the get-go. I attribute a lot of our survival, a lot of how we were able to reach the places that we were able to connect with them is that we weren't afraid to put ourselves out there. <coughs> Hi, my name is Dawn. You know, if you don't keep calling somebody, if you don't keep reaching out to them, they're not gonna hear you. These bigger events, Lisa Marie Presley's baby shower with pink, we did these little soaps, oh my goodness. You know, it was absolutely, amazing what we were able to pull off just by being persistent. We managed to support our growth. We were about 200% constantly growing. 
because people like Terry and her husband Chris and Lena and her husband Todd and my mom and my sisters and my sisters and Sarah were willing to give us all the bit of time they had. The value to a growing business for people who are willing to work for food is priceless. <laughs> you know, one day I'll pay you. I promise. The only place that I think that I guess where, where vision changes is when your business morphs. And we started pulling together accounts like Red Envelope. And we discovered that we really need to expand our products. We've got the soaps, we've got the candles, but eventually new things need to be produced. And then we got Soft Surroundings, and we got Cambria Co., which is a division of Hallmark. The private label business was really doing well for us. American Stationery is a 90-year-old American Stationery company that is the largest stationery company in the States. Their luxury line is Mary Made. It was just constantly in growth. Part of our excitement as we morph our line, this is, goes through the cycle of Mike's frugalness. We've got to figure out a way to keep the cash flow coming all year long, not just at the end of the year. Is partnering with people like Alyssa Milano. We've been fortunate enough to find ourselves really in her private home as we create new lines with her. She's MLB licensed, NFL licensed, NHL, NCAA and NBA. We're probably about 45 days before our line launches privately with her. The other thing that we just experienced is a wonderful connection with the folks at Modern Home Living. These are the guys who do FTV Cribs and that what they're creating is a magazine and a TV sh channel that is if Home Garden TV and MTV Cribs came together, this would be the baby it would produce. I just got back from LA, which I will tell you why in a little bit and I was able to see their $3.7 million penthouse, which was amazing. So one of the things that we learned different about our products than the other products out there is quality. Mark from um, Upon This Rock and Wilson said to me, the bitterness of poor quality lingers on long after the sweetness of cheap prices is forgotten. Think about it. How many times you thought you had a deal and then it broke? Or it didn't you know, stand up to what you thought it would be? This is how we make sure that we keep Carb Solutions different. As we're building our brand and we're adding on these other licenses, we've got to make sure that our quality stands out. This is our big surprise. We've got a lot of expectations to where this year is going to go. I don't even know where to even like kind of like pull this together and make it little. So we have this big evil competitor who we fought all along. And they had these great investors and they, they did all these wonderful things. And you know, you can't always trust what something looks like on the outside. We received a, comp a call from our competitor and said, hey, would you have lunch with us? And we said, hmm, no, but we'll give you 10 minutes. And we went to see them and they said, you know, this guy who's leading this company, who's not a part of the company, we're, you know, the equity people, he's been in the business for a long time. And it's just not what we expected it to be. And we were like, hmm, yeah, we know, and decided not to say too much, but walked away surprised how much we liked them. I ended up being at the Atlanta show this January. Then they wanted to take me out to dinner. I told them I wouldn't eat with them, but I would have a drink with them. More conversations happened. I think we drank for like three hours. I kept putting water in my martini. Every time they turned away, because I was afraid I would get drunk and say something stupid. But what ended up happening is that Carve Solutions has just acquired our competition. That pretty box doesn't exist anymore. The investors, they're now ours and the evil guy is gone. And it's kind of like karma coming all together. So this weekend, the middle shot is a girl named Crystal. She's the, the gentleman in the gray hair in the far corner's daughter. She's 28. And I was able to introduce her to Life at Carb Solutions this past weekend. We were at the ABC show, The Bachelor. We were the wedding favors for Jason and Molly at this amazing resort. Yeah, I know. <laughs> So the most embarrassing part is, when we first got invited to go, I'm going, who's Jason and Molly? It was like when Colin Cowie's office called, and I'm like, who's Colin Cowie? And Lynn is screaming, Colin Cowie, the wedding planner? Like, okay, is this good? So yeah, we got to experience that, and it was pretty amazing. And it's, again, just the beginning of where Carver Solutions is going next. And that's all I got. Questions? Except for the group.
girl that needs to be on LinkedIn? Any questions? <laughs> Any thoughts? You guys are easy, or it's really late. Say that again, what time what? What, uh, what town do you manufacture your products? Our products are actually made in uh, Winooski, but then we custom carve them in Williston. And we're moving out of our house in 12 days. <laughs> that smells familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. They do private label for Victoria's Secret, for Mary Kay. They're really the top private label producer in the States. Any sales? I can email it to you. Definitely. So 100% owned by you. You've got minority investors. You our our new standpoint is we will have minority investors. Um, Mike has has sold out. He's going to be moving on to some fun engineering things in the next three months or so. But he's going to have to stay in tow if there's ever another machine that I need him to make or create. But I do have minority investors as well at this standpoint. And do you do your banking locally or? We bank at Key Bank. Do you want me to bank somewhere else? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There, there were times when I thought we weren't going to launch. There were times when I thought we were going to tank. There were times that I thought that the competition was going to come in and totally take over. You know, we, it was just us. But we had the support of our family, our friends, our vendors were always encouraging us to go on. We've not experienced with predatory pricing. I don't know if you guys are familiar with predatory pricing, but this January, I found myself working, with, working against a company that was selling things for half what we were. I didn't know how to market against that, but we did through quality. I'm taking a marketing management class this semester, mm -hmm. and our semester long project is um, personal branding, it's personal branding assignment. And aside from the LinkedIn, which I'm going to get on immediately, <laughs> <laughs> what, what advice might you have for me to take back to the kids in my class? I think when you're thinking of personal branding, go back to making that business plan because that's going to help you look at yourself from the inside out. It's a hard thing to do, to really look at yourself and say, you know, who am I really? You know, it's hard for me not to micromanage. Working with Mike, you know, he gave me the reminder, you need to let somebody else do that for you. You need to let somebody else do that for you. We're only going to be able to grow so much if you do. It's hard to look at yourself and say, I'm weak here. Yeah, but you've got to find where your strengths are. And I try not to micromanage anymore most of the time. Assumption how much you are local and how much you, is it all out of your head and your community has grown up or have you now got advisors, boards of directors? We have we have we have private advisors. We we sit at the kitchen table with Chris and Terry and, and talk about different things that we want to do. I talk to Peter Ash from Twincraft and get some advice from him. But the majority of everything that we do is just internal brainstorming. And it's networking. You know, as I'm reaching out there, there's never that a specific advisor, but you find somebody who knows somebody when you're trying to get somewhere, and somebody's usually there to open a door for you. We talked the other day, and you mentioned that people here don't really know who you are or what right. you sell, but in Hollywood, it's, you're all the rage. It's the strangest I mean, how do you, sometimes is that a problem? I think the, the biggest problem... Well, definitely. I think the biggest problem for me is that, you know, it's probably, you talk about personal branding, it's a little bit of an ego hit. You know, how come the people in our backyard don't understand what we do? And you can go across the country and find stores that carry car solutions everywhere. And I'm not sure how, if our demographic, you know, we weren't just hitting the right demographic to really build a relationship with our Vermont customers. We have a very specific base of Vermont co customers, but they're very, very tight niche. So maybe it's probably I need to do some more marketing in our own home state to make it stronger but it's been more of a nationwide exposure. Because you're so big in Hollywood, do you ever plan on relocating? No. <laughs> no, you know, it's, it's, this is the, the best place in the world for, for Sarah to grow up, and even though, you know, we travel, Mike's traveled the world, there's no way I would put her anywhere else. We originally came from Indiana, 
and uh, I think that my sister can attest to that Vermont is a great way for us to be. You know, it goes back to that distinctive assets. It was that one event. And the entire time that I was at the event, I was constantly introducing myself as the Vermont girl that knew absolutely nothing. You know, who do I need to know? Who do I need to meet? It was so bad that when these, you know, stars would come through, when they realized I didn't know who these stars were because I worked so much, then they started running up to me going, that's Fergie. I'm like, I know who Fergie is, you know? <laughs> I just didn't know who David Krumholtz was from numbers. But it was really, it's about networking. And once I kept that network going, they would move you to the next person, to the next person, to the next person, and it just kept growing. It was like LinkedIn. <laughs> My plans for the future are to dominate the world in the soap and candle industry <laughs> in a smaller scale. <laughs> Anyone else? You didn't really talk about your talk about when the candles came in. The candles came in in many ways to sell more soap. And it was how do we combat this company out there that had these multiple different soaps and multiple different packages, and one of the ways that we could do things different was to bring a candle to the table. And Mike basically created our candle formula because nobody could make a square formula that was carvable. So the engineer took control, and I said, we knew we were doing candles. He hates to do candles. <laughs> Are we good? Great. Thank you guys very much for having me.